I've chosen to give myself a difficult task in this khutbah and talk about something that's clearly politically incorrect. And I want to start by a couple of comments that all Muslims, including myself, should be very clear on and we should remind ourselves of repeatedly. We're not sorry for being Muslim. And we don't apologize for anything that Allah has revealed in His book or that has been instructed in the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. We don't have to owe any, anyone else an explanation. We don't have to be embarrassed or ashamed that your book says this, this, and this, how can you believe that? Your prophet said this, this, and that, how can you believe that? How can you agree with that? There are people that constantly try to put us in this position, and we feel like we have to defend ourselves, and sometimes we don't know the answer. And sometimes we hear things being said about our prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, or things being quoted from the Quran, and somebody will ask you, this sounds pretty barbaric, this sounds pretty violent, this sounds pretty inhumane or unjust. How can you be okay with that? You people actually believe this stuff? You guys think this is okay? And at first, when you hear it, you're like, well, you know, technically, we're, no, we're not okay with it. And you take a step back. And it's okay to say, I don't understand any better. But it's not okay to say, well, if that's what it says, I disagree. Because we don't disagree. Everything in this book, everything Allah has revealed, is not only something that we believe in, even if we're uncomfortable. First of all, there's no room for discomfort. ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُونَ فِي صُدُورِهِمْ حَرَجَ مِمَّا قَضَيْتِ You know, لَا يَجِدُونَ فِي صُدُورِهِمْ حَرَجَ مِمَّا قَضَيْتِ they, they don't have any room for any discomfort in their chest left after whatever decisions you've made. This is what, who we are in Islam. This is what makes us Muslim. Not only do we not have discomfort, but we're happy before Allah for everything He revealed. It is not a source of discomfort for us, it is a source of joy. فَبِذَلِكَ فَلْيَفْرَحُوا هُوَ خَيْرٌ مِمَّا يَجْمَعُونَ Because of the Qur'an, they should be overjoyed. Every ayah of the Qur'an is part of my iman and part of your faith. Every ayah of the Qur'an should bring me joy. I should be happy to believe in it. I should be proud to believe in it. I should have confidence in it. And it's a problem when you and I start thinking, there are some things we should be worried about. They say it in the Qur'an. Allah says it in the Qur'an. How am I going to explain this to someone else? Oh man, if a non-Muslim asks me, I'm in trouble. You know? And we take a back foot. This is actually a point of shame for myself and for you that we don't know what Allah's book says. And when we don't understand what Allah's book says, we don't make an effort to explain it. That's the first thing I wanted to bring to your attention before we deal with the subject matter itself. The second thing I want to bring to your attention is this is the book not just of guidance, but of fitrah. Allah revealed this book for the benefit of humanity. And as a matter of fact, even jinn can benefit as far as Allah is concerned. And when He revealed this book, He knows exactly who He sent it to. He sent it to the creation He made Himself. Doesn't he know who he created? Allah will not give you and me instructions without knowing who we are first. And he knows us better than we know ourselves. You know when someone gives you instructions and you can say, well, if they understood my situation, they would give different instructions. Sometimes your boss can ask you to do something and you can say, well, you know what? Right now I have these other, other things I have to do. You don't understand those. If I wish he understood my situation and then gave me these instructions, maybe his mind would change. Maybe there's some room for negotiation. Nobody knows what you're going through, what your life is like, what your situation is like, what your capabilities are like better than Allah. And Allah is the one who gave you and me these instructions. So he knows exactly who he's talking to and what he needs to say. This is perfect for all human beings. This is also part of my iman. This is part of my faith. And for me to think that Allah will say something that is not for my own benefit. This is also, it goes against my own faith. Allah will never tell me or you anything unless that is beneficial for us. This book is an act of mercy from Allah. It's an act of rahmah from Allah. This is why he says, Ar-Rahmanu Allam Al-Qur'an. Of all the names of Allah associated with teaching the Qur'an, you know, he could have just said, Al-Aziz Allam Al-Qur'an. The authority taught the Qur'an so that you take the Qur'an as an authority. No, but he described himself as the teacher who is Ar-Rahman. Excessively, overwhelmingly merciful and loving and caring. He's the one who taught the Qur'an. So when he teaches it, he's teaching it out of love, out of care, out of mercy. So even if at face value you see something and you find it harsh, actually even in that there is a mercy for you. And so with that in mind, what I want to share with you is that the ahkam, the rulings of Allah, the governance of Allah, the commands of Allah, when we don't understand them, we might think they're harsh. But when you actually understand them, and you should not try to understand them because you want to explain them to someone else. You should understand them for yourself. That is the wrong reason to learn something. So what I want to share with you is not so you have something good to say to your non-Muslim co-worker. We don't owe them an explanation first. We owe ourselves an explanation because we owe ourselves the obligation to understand the book of Allah better. 
When we do that first, then naturally it will come from our heart that we will want to share its goodness with others. You know? If, you, if the only reason you want to learn about Islam is public relations, there's a problem. There's not the reason you should want to learn about Islam. Just so you can make less embarrassing conversation with your non-Muslim friends. That's not the reason. So now, coming to this, Allah Azza wa Jal revealed ahkam, governance, laws, commandments that directly appeal to the nature of the human being because Allah knows who He created and who He is giving instructions to. So when we understand Allah's commands, the idea in the Qur'an is actually they, they resonate. They, there's something inside you, a conscience inside you that Allah created, this fitrah inside you that Allah put. When you understand the commands of Allah, forget about discomfort, you're like, that makes complete sense. That's so wise, that's so beautiful. And if we haven't arrived at that yet, maybe we haven't thought about it enough, about the, the, the ahkam of Allah, the rulings, the governance of Allah. And on the other hand, maybe our hearts aren't pure enough yet. May Allah Azza wa give us both of those things, an understanding of the Book of Allah and purity in our hearts. So one of the most politically incorrect places in the Qur'an is about the, the one who, the male or the female who commit adultery. That you should whip them, you know, فَجْلِدُوا كُلَّ وَاحِدٍ مِنْهُمَا مِئَةَ جَلْدًا Lash them or whip them a hundred times. So the Qur'an says that y'all gotta whip the people who commit adultery a hundred times. What kind of barbaric law is that? And then we take a step, no, 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 well, you know, in modern times, things are different, it's okay, it's not the same time. Thing. Wait, 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 this is the timeless book of Allah. So let's understand what Allah says first, before you worry about explaining it to somebody else. Ibn Ashur rahimahullah commenting on the words azaniyatu wa zani in the beginning of this ayah, suggests that because the ism, the noun is used, that this is actually talking about people who repeatedly do this all the time. It's talking about prostitutes. It's talking about people who are in the illegal sexual industry. First and foremost. And there's plenty of historical, there's not something that just came out. Plenty of classical scholarship dealing with what is the context of this ayah, what is it talking about. And this was a serious problem in the city of Medina before the Prophet moved there, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And now the Prophet has moved there and the problem continues. And so the Quran is gonna comment on a problem that's going on in this city. And it was so threatening. Here's the part that's important. Everybody here I think has heard that the act of adultery or the act of illegal intimate relations between a man and a woman will not be punishable until you have four witnesses. You may have heard this before, that you have to have four witnesses. Now any commonsensical human being will know that nobody does something like that with four witnesses around. Nobody does that with four witnesses around. The only way you can do something like that with four witnesses around is if you're out in public. What is called in modern law, a public display of indecency. In modern law, in many countries, they have laws about public displays of indecency. As a matter of fact, if something like this was happening on the street, Texas laws are there to arrest those people and punish them. If something like that was happening on an airplane, there are laws for a few years in jail. So this is not just something new in Islam, you know, or that was brought in Islam and no one else has it. Virtually every civilized nation in the world has laws dealing with public display of indecency. They have them. And the Qur'an has them too, because the Qur'an is preparing a new civilization. A civilization of believers. And this is a very serious crime. Because if that kind of shamelessness is happening openly in the street, where even four people can walk by and see it, then there are going to be children, young people. There are going to be innocent people that, that haven't been exposed to that kind of corrupt images, and this is going to damage them psychologically. It's going to undermine something that is so important to the core of a family, it's going to mess people's minds up. When you, when you make something that should remain private, and you make it public, then it corrupts people. It, it messes them up. Now let's take a step back and understand something. We're living at a time where, what, forget four witnesses, you can have four million witnesses because the pornography industry and the filth industry sells itself with billions and billions of dollars. Internet marketers, you know, internet marketers that can sell anything from like bamboo sticks to towels, you know the, the most successful internet product? And internet, they're in the pornography industry. They're the leaders in marketing. When you go to marketing seminars, internet marketing seminars, the guys at the top of the industry that are making the most bang for the buck are the ones that are selling zina online. They're the ones. So this is completely public now. And when it is that public, can you imagine the damage that it does to the minds of people that are exposed to it? The damage that it's already done? How many children are messed up? How many young adults are messed up? How many marriages are getting destroyed? Because of these images floating in the public? 
how, how almost impossible it's become to not be exposed to some of that filth, no matter how hard you try, because there's so much money pumped into making sure that you'll see something like it. And so the Qur'an comes along and says, this is a very serious problem with very serious ramifications. People will become twisted and, and you know, confused. And they're going to become, they're going to commit crimes that won't even make sense. How many kinds of disgusting crimes are committed in the United States even against children? Even against, and violent sexual crimes. How many are reported every other minute? These are things that happen when you get exposed to this kind of filth over and over again, and it becomes normalized. You know, so the Quran steps in and says, "No, if someone does this in public, then you have to punish them." And this public, this now let's talk about this punishment. They're not killed; they're la they're whipped, and they're whipped a hundred times. And when they're whipped a hundred times, Allah Azza wa Jalla doesn't say just whip them and that's it. The fuqaha, the scholars of this deen, the Sahaba themselves, they would have exhaustive discussion on how to deal with these people. By the way, this is not the only time Allah talks about punishing people like this. There are ayat that came before Surah An-Nur, much before Surah An-Nur and Surah An-Nisa. And in Surah An-Nisa, وَالَّذَانِ يَأْتِيَانِهَا مِنْكُمْ فَآذُوهُمَا The two of them, there was sometimes there were Muslim, some guy became Muslim in Medina, he became Muslim, and some girl became Muslim. But before they became Muslim, they were boyfriend and girlfriend. And they had no concept of marriage. They don't know anything because they're not Muslim. And now all of a sudden they've become Muslim. But just because they took shahada does not mean that they become super spiritual people overnight. They're human beings. They're developing. Like Allah says Himself, You're going to develop little by little by little. So Allah even describes the scenario where even Muslims, in the beginning in Medina life, even Muslims may have committed such an act. Some young, young man got tempted and he, he did something out of wedlock. He's not even married yet, and he did something with a girl. What do you do with them? The ayat came down, which were later mansukh by these ayat, by, many, by the opinion of many scholars. What was the punishment for them? The two of them that have done that mistake among you, فَآذُوهُمَا Then cause them pain. Allah didn't say how cause them pain. He just says cause them pain. So the sahaba would have a debate. Ibn Abbas would say, other sahaba would come and say, maybe what Allah means is you should yell at them. How could you do this? You'd be ashamed of yourself. And that means cause them pain. Other sahaba would say, we should take a stick and hit the bottom of their feet. Like 10 times, cause them pain. Nobody thought about whipping them and cutting them and hanging them upside down and stoning. No, 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 no. None of that yet. They're just young people who made a mistake. Take it easy. They just became Muslim. This mistake happened. They need to be reprimanded. And by the way, early, this is in Quran. فَإِن تَابَ وَأَصْلَحَ فَأَعْرِضُوا عَنْهُمَا And if they've both made tawbah, and they say, we're never gonna do it again. Or maybe they even get married now. Leave them alone. Don't make a bigger deal out of it. Leave, فَأَعْرِضُوا عَنْهُمَا Ignore them. Leave them alone. إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ تَوَابَ الرَّحِيمًا Allah Himself has always been someone who accepts tawbah. Let them move on with their life. They made a big mistake, yes, but let them move on with their life. Don't expose them more. You've already done what you could. And later on when the punishment came, it came. And by the way, even then the four witnesses was necessary, by the way. Even then the four witnesses was necessary. And so later on, when this commandment, it got tougher. If something happens now, there better be whipping. They better be whipped. Well, how are they whipped? You imagine some big, you know, leather thing, and they just, you know, and then the guy is bleeding, and he's, they do a hundred times, by the tenth time he's already dead. No, 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 hold on a second. The fuqaha would discuss this. They would say, never whip them in front of, in, you know, in a hot day or an extremely cold day, because the skin will be extra sensitive. Don't whip them out in the, the blazing sun, because that's, that's not punishment Allah intends for them. When the guy raises his hand, his armpit shouldn't show. So he shouldn't go like this. Like, you know, we think that when you're gonna punish, then the guy we should get is like a pro wrestler or somebody, who's gonna, when he whips, is gonna be like, you know, serious. No, no, that's not the point. As a matter of fact, it's more ceremonial than anything else. In Islamic history, the, this punishment has been executed. Uh, by the way, Islam spread across continents, you know that. Hundreds of millions of people have been Muslim throughout the last 14, 1500 years. And this is recorded to have happened maybe three, four times. There was not an occasion where this would even be executed. That's Islamic history. Across the, across the continents. And if, if it did happen, make sure their armpit doesn't even show. 
and they hit. And if it, if it hits any part of the body that can be lethal, don't hit there. And if one part is getting injured, don't hit there again. And don't hit on the face. And don't hit on sensitive parts. This is all this exhaustive instruction. But that's actually not my khutbah. My khutbah is not about explaining this punishment to you. The point is, Allah decided that public display of indecency is a major crime because it damages society, so it should be punished. And the principle here, the principle is that anything, and there are different kinds of sins, but if you do a kind of sin that damages society, then you should be punished in this world. There are sins you and I do that only damage us. They only damage us. And we will answer to Allah on Judgment Day. You don't get punished for them over here in this world. There's no had for you here in this world because the damage is limited to yourself, maybe your family, something like that. But when you do a crime that hurts others, that damages others, that damages society, then there are social punishments in Islam. Allah is not interested in torturing you for everything you do. That's not this religion. You've got it confused with something else. Now if you understand that, the real crux of my khutbah, very little time left in this khutbah, but what I wanted to get to, is this is how many whips? A hundred. Then Allah mentions another crime that is almost just as bad. Almost just as bad. Because that crime, you should get whipped 80 times. 80 times. Now practically, if somebody is being hit a hundred times, and somebody else is being hit how many? 80 times, you can't even tell the difference. You can't, I mean, who's gonna sit there and count? It's humiliating either way. It's embarrassing either way. And by the way, I didn't mention the ending of the previous ayah when the whipping is happening. Allah says, Wal yashhad adabahuma ta'ifatun min al mu'mineen. First of all, la ta'khudkum bihima ra'fatun fi dinillah. Don't become compassionate when you're punishing them. In other words, even the people punishing them, even the one raising the whip, feels bad and says, I don't want to do this. And Allah says, I know you don't want to do it, but still you have to do it. Allah is not telling him to be harsh. Allah is telling him, I acknowledge the love for you have for your sinful Muslim brother. We are learning in this ayah that people, even the people who committed such a terrible sin in public, even then the Muslim has so much love for the fellow Muslim that he can't even get himself to punish without having rahmah and ra'fa, compassion and mercy in his heart for the one he's punishing. You're not, some people think, I want to establish sharia, which means I just want to whip somebody. You know, I just want to hit him real good, because that means, Iqamatul Hudud. What Quran are you reading? Allah Azza wa is describing to you that you already have ra'fa. You have compassion and hold it back because you have to do a difficult thing. You have to hit your fellow believer. And then after he's, he says that, he says a group of mu'mineen should watch it. Not just any believers. And mu'min means mature believers. People with, you know, ar-rasikhuna fil ilmi wal iman. People who are, are deeply rooted in their faith. He doesn't just say, Alladina amanu. He says, Al Mu'mineen. So mature believers should watch the punishment happening. Mature believers, worshippers, spiritually mature people, older people, wiser people, they're watching the punishment. Why? Why should they watch? They should bring young people to watch. Hey, don't do this. See what's going to happen to you? Allah didn't say that. Allah said, bring, bring the mu'mineen. And Ibn Qayyim and other scholars commented, the reason they should bring them is as they are being punished, the mu'mineen will be making dua for the ones that are being punished. Because they are not dead yet. They are still alive. And if Allah condemned them to hellfire, then Allah did not want them to breathe anymore. So long as they are breathing in this world, the room for tawbah is open. And so they're paying the price for their sin in this world. They could use the dua. Ya Allah, give them sabr, give them tawbah, accept their tawbah, let them move on with their life, unite us with them in akhirah in a good place. That's the job of those who are watching. The job of those who are watching is not to say, see that? That's what you get. That's not their job. This is Quran. And so, a hundred lashes. But what crime is there that you get 80 lashes for? I get shaken when I read this. Wallahi al-Azim, I get shaken. وَالَّذِينَ يَرْمُونَ الْمُحْصَنَاتِ Those, I'll translate badly first. Those who accuse decent women. Those who accuse decent women. That's not a, the best translation that gives you some idea of what the ayah is talking about. Now let me tell you the language Allah uses. Allah says, those who throw something, yarmuna, those who throw something in the direction of women that are protected by family. Muhsanat means women inside a camp, inside a fort. Allah describes families as a kind of protection. So whether they are mothers, daughters, sisters, wives, they're all muhsanat. 
They're all muhsanat. And all of those women that are in a family, those who throw anything in their direction. Now what in the world does that mean? The Qur'an, أَبْلَغُ kalam, As I was describing in the Arabic part of my khutbah, the most eloquent, the perfect speech. Allah could have just said, الَّذِينَ يَتَّهِمُونَ الْمُحْسَنَاتِ بِالزِّنَا Those who accuse women of having committed adultery. Awdah. It's clear. He didn't say that. Allah Azza wa is very precise. People are not going to a woman and saying she's done adultery. They're saying, that woman, I'm not sure. I think I saw her with this other guy the other day. I don't know what they were talking about. That much. That much. You're not saying, you know people when they say the most terrible things, before they say them, they say, I'm not saying anything. But, uh, you know. And then as soon as you say, I'm not saying anything, that means you're going to say the worst possible thing. You know? And I wish you weren't saying anything, but you are. And when people do that, people make a co- passing comment. Those two, I don't know, something's going on. Dal mein kuch kala hai, kuch chakkar chal hai. Something. I, saw, I think I saw some text messages. I think I was, you know, she was, she was on the phone and she was smiling. And what's that about? You know? Why are they standing so close to each other? Why is this happening? Why? Just these comments, just these comments. This is enough to fall under Yarmoon al muhsanat Because Allah left the language open. You didn't accuse them explicitly, you just threw something in that direction. And the rest is left to shaitan and your imagination. Because when you say, I'm not saying anything, but those two, I don't know. Then the next person is gonna say, I don't know what I've, I don't know what you heard, you know what I heard? Those two, I think they're, you know. And then it gets worse, and worse, and worse, and worse. And people are talking, and everybody's saying, I'm not saying anything. And everybody's saying, shh, don't tell anyone. And everybody's talking, and everybody's saying to everybody else, don't tell anyone. (laughs) And you know what happens then? The dignity of an entire family is destroyed. The, 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 chas- the purity of a woman who you have no evidence against is destroyed. No, but I did see them in the mall. Really? ثُمَّ لَمْ يَأْتُوا بِأَرْبَعَةِ shuhada. If you make such an accusation and you did not produce four witnesses, they didn't come forward with four witnesses. And then the fuqaha would describe, you not four witnesses that they both, they all saw them in the movie theater together. Or they all saw them in the mall together. Or they all saw them driving in the same direction. Or they all saw... No, 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 no. If they haven't seen them commit the ultimate sin with their own eyes, if they haven't seen that, then whip them 80 times. Understand the seriousness of talking about people's dignity, especially the Muslim woman's dignity. The seriousness of it. That Allah put it right next to people who commit zina in public. And I want to end with this. I want you to think about this. When Allah talked about people who commit zina, adultery in public, by the end of it, isn't Allah opening the door of forgiveness for them? Allah is saying about them that they should be punished, but then there should be, there should, you, you already feel compassion for them, the mu'mineen should overlook them. So they can make dua for them, that's the implication. But when it came to the people who accuse, the people who throw accusations, who throw slanderous, scandalous comments, or say, no, 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 they don't even say something, they ask something. That's even better. I'm not saying, I'm just asking. Do you think something's going on? Just that much. Even a question is throwing something. And when you do this much, what does Allah Azza wa Jalla say about these people? Not only the, the whipping, but He says, وَلَا تَقْبَلُوا لَهُمْ شَهَادَةً أَبَدًا Don't ever accept their testimony. Don't ever be nice to these people again. My goodness. This sounds worse. And then on top of that, وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ And those are the ones that are ultimately corrupt. They are the ultimate. Allah didn't even say that about the Zani. He didn't even say, أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ He says, أُولَٰئِكُمْ الْفَاسِقُونَ About these people. The question is, why are they being whipped? And that's the last thing. Why are they being whipped? Because when you talk about people in this way, then you are also damaging society. Remember I told you, Allah only punishes in this world when you do things that damage society, that damage other people. When you damage the dignity of a Muslim, a Muslim male, a Muslim female, when you damage their dignity, this is a punishable crime in this world, not only in the next. 
is a very serious matter. The izzah, the, the, the ikram, you know, the, the nobility, the dignity of a Muslim. There's something very big to Allah. Allah will make ikhtisas of it and say, وَلِلَّهِ الْعِزَّةِ وَلِرَسُولِهِ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah alone owns dignity and it's given to the and it's for the Prophet and the believers. This is something Allah gave to the Muslim. You cannot and I cannot take away what Allah gave. This is something Allah gave and we have to protect it. And we have to, one of the most damaging things we can do is with our tongues. When you have an assumption, just remember the word of Allah. Stay away from making assumptions. Some assumptions can become very grave sin. Very serious sin. Stay away from making assumptions. Give benefit of the doubt. You don't know those two. They're holding hands. They're walking over there. Oh, they must be married. They must be brother and sister. No, no, but I don't think... Leave it. Go the other way. Go make istighfar. That's not your business. مِنْ حُسْنِ إِسْلَامِ الْمَرْئِ تَرْكُهُ مَا Part of the beauty of Islam of a person, they leave alone what's not their business. It ain't your business. Don't talk about it. May Allah Azza wa Jal protect our tongues, protect our hearts, protect ourselves from each other's harm. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us of those who are careful in speaking about the dignity of others. May Allah Azza wa Jal not make us of those who make excuses and hide behind excuses. May Allah Azza wa Jal give us the ability to see our mistakes for what they are and seek His forgiveness and the forgiveness of others whom we may have spoken ill about. May Allah Azza wa Jal protect the dignity of all of the Muslims, especially the women of this ummah. May Allah Azza wa Jal protect the dignity of our mothers, our wives, our daughters, our sisters, May Allah Azza wa Jal protect the dignity of our entire family, dignity of our entire family, and may Allah Azza wa Jal help us raise a generation that is much closer to Allah than we've been able to be. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Quran al Hakim, wa nafa'ani wa iya kum bil ayati wa dhikr al Hakim. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi al ladina stafa, khususan ala aflalihim, wa khatam in nabiyin, Muhammadin al Amin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. يقول الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد عباد الله رحمكم الله اتقوا الله إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء القربة وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة كانت على المؤمنين كتابا منقوتا